layer protection. Um, and then there's a whole list of state, tribes, and local permits that also have to be addressed. Floodplain issues, utilities, right-of-ways, local land groups, uh, river authorities, uh, groundwater um, entities. And so kind of what the point of this slide is, is to get something accomplished, you have to jump through a number of hoops. And to kind of get through all these hoops, you have to look at a project holistically and you need to get stakeholders, whether it's the owners, whether it's the local regulators, um, as well as kind of the uh, other entities within the, within the local population, all have their say in it so that you're moving forward, you don't get kind of roadblocked with regulations or issues. So to kind of accomplish all these regulations, we have to look at the next step is to do a formal uh, assessment of the property. And I know this list looks a little bit daunting, but a lot of them are fairly simple. Uh, in kind of remote imaging and analysis, aquatic surveys, if you actually are concerned with sensitive species within the waterways, uh, habitat assessments, if you know that different species might live there, you can actually go out and do habitat assessments. And if the suitable habitat's not there, you can cut that off quickly with the agencies and save yourself uh, a lot of review time. Uh, invasive species surveys, why this is critical, is because if you're trying to do improvement to the property to gain a general lift, generally or normally invasive species control is a, a very efficient, quick way to do this, and you get a lift by removing those monocultures that are developed by invasive species. Uh, threatened and endangered surveys, assessments, and consultations. This is covered under the Endangered Species Act. Um, at a minimum, if there is endangered species, you're looking at about a year and a half of coordination just to kind of get through those, those issues with, with the agencies. Um, as I said, you know, if you're under the National Historic Preservation Act, you have to do cultural res uh, resource assessments. This can only be completed with a archeologist that meets uh, minimum requirements, which is a master's in five years experience. Um, and then depending on your construction timeline, you, you know, if you're actually planning to build during nesting season, you might be on the hook to do nest surveys, although under the current administration, uh, there has been some movement on what's considered incidental versus purposeful take. Uh, that's a whole other presentation. Um, and then kind of a wildlife and vegetation surveys. And this is so that you can understand what the general use It's not that they necessarily afforded protection, but if you're going to start looking at the functionality and what, what lift you can do and what impacts these properties can accomplish or, or take in as part of an impact to still maintain their mission, you have to know what's there. And we'll kind of go over why all of these are, are important. And again, I know this list looks daunting, but some of these are fairly quick surveys, some of them are desktop. So again, coming back to kind of this project outline, and we were presented with the problem is if this property is being used by the youth in this area, and we're trying to maintain that balance of still having a functional property that has more than one use, right? We want to be able to benefit those children, you want to be able to have agricultural practices, you want fishing, you want um, you know, potential oil and gas, you want to continue to get revenue from gravel mines and sand mines, which allows you to turn that back into the uh, organization and support more kids. So it's sort of this balance. Like no property can just be an island that doesn't have more of a global impact. And that's where you, you have to look at how you can use conservation to look at it as a whole and bring in the organizations from around and actually increase your service by utilizing your property to its fullest extent. And so, as Rick mentioned, uh, you know, one of the big pressures is losing this this corridor on the on the left side. And you know, you can fight it to a certain degree, but if it's for public use, the property will go through eminent domain and will actually be condemned, and the DOT will still get it. They have to pay a market price plus, but you know, you end up not really gaining anything by fighting it. Um, and then there's a trail on the, on the uh, east side, and this is kind of a continuous trail, so you don't really want to have a continuous trail without a 4,000 foot section for the sunny property. And again, trails are good, it gets people outdoors, so it doesn't not align with the mission, but you have to understand how it's going to affect the property as a whole. And then, you know, one of the other ones they're talking about doing is sand and gravel. This property has historically been used for sand and gravel mines. So it makes sense to kind of continue on with that process because it is a revenue stream. And by kind of managing that appropriately, it's not necessarily a negative effect on the property. Uh, and then oil and gas is kind of off there 
and on its own, because although that would be a pressure, uh, you know, with new technologies, there's not necessarily a surface disturbance due to directional drill, and so there wouldn't be a direct impact, it would be off to the side, and so that's not really considered um, too much more in, in this part of the functionality assessment. So as, as most of you probably know, when you start kind of doing your site assessments or your site conditions, uh, the first thing you go out and look at is the land use and you kind of do your mapping to understand what your overall projects are. And, you know, you kind of look at your open areas, your infrastructure, which your roads, your buildings, your parking lots. Um, and then we map waters as just this general kind of what portion of this property is water. Um, and then basically the irrigated areas, which are agricultural practices, which you can grow, harvest, sell. Um, and then there's the tree farm, and that's sort of the forest of cover. And then we took it one step further and kind of broke out the different types of waters. And, you know, we had forested shrubs grow wetlands, we had herbaceous wetlands, we had an open water, which are these ponds that are being used for fishing, uh, and then we also have this headwater stream that kind of runs up to the middle of the property. Um, and that gives us kind of this, this overview. But, you know, what does this over me, overview mean? Um, you know, you can have basically, you know, identified all these areas, but so what? So you know how much agricultural fields you know, you know how much parking lot you have, what does that do for you as a, as a practitioner looking at the general impacts? And basically the next step is, is looking at the functionality of these areas, right? You want to understand what is these separate areas giving to you back as far as are they doing, you know, different type functions that are beneficial. And so then we take the next step and start looking at the functionality of these areas to see what we can do to uplift and what we can do to offset some of the potential impacts that are likely to occur to this property. And again, as I said, one of the primary regulatory drivers in the U.S. is wetlands and waterways. And so, you know, when we're looking to do offsets or beneficial uplift, we focus on the waters and the wetlands. And you know, one of the key things is looking at, and this is kind of a, a little bit more of a new process, but looking at the function of wetlands, not just for their vegetation and not just for their ecological benefit, but start looking at them for flood storage and conveyance, groundwater recharge. Uh, if you're looking at coastal waters, you're actually looking at wave reduction, erosion control, uh, you know, habitat for different species. And what's kind of interesting is this is a landlocked piece of property uh, in the middle of Colorado, and if you kind of start looking at the functionality of it, um, you can see that all of these with the stars actually are active functions for these, these wetlands and streams and open water bodies. And so what that means is when you start looking at your assessment process, you're not tied to a simple revegetation or a simple planting project. You can actually start looking at other benefits and other lift projects, uh, such as like water treatment for runoff from the DOT roads, and you can look at other things, and so you're not tied to the standard, we're going to revegetate this with a bigger diversity, and that's what we got. You can actually start looking at it holistically and say, okay, you know, we need more groundwater infiltration. That's a big issue in Colorado. We need more sediment control because we, we have agricultural practices, and the runoff from those fields is starting to impact the stream, water quality, over suspended solids. It's a big issue. And so you can actually start utilizing your wetlands for that and then get that, that capital gain from those type of systems. So again, when I'm kind of going into these functional assessments, um, you know, <clears throat> when you start looking at functional assessments for waters, you want to look at it as what can you get out of these functional assessments. <clears throat> so you can do kind of the long-term monitoring, which means that, you know, you can run this model or this functional assessment model, and then you have something to compare back, compare back to. You can see if you're getting a general lift, if you're starting to see a degradation, and it gives you kind of that baseline for that. You can use it to tie into research type projects. So you can understand long term what this wetland is doing in this type of uh, watershed compared to something adjacent in a different watershed. Uh, business and land use, this is kind of what we're using it for. It's you know what can these what can these waters accommodate as far as impacts and what can we do to them to offset other and future impacts to still maintain the mission of this property. Uh, conservation, this kind of ties back into it. Uh, you hear a lot about conservation. And again, like predominantly when you hear conservation projects, it's revegetation. But there's so much more opportunities that you can apply to wetlands uh, and waters. And then the transfer of property, right? If you're going to sell this property, you need to know what's on there. You need to know what the benefits are, you need to know what 
what's regulatory restricted for construction, and, and you know what can be used for habitat, what can be used for water rights, and all of that can be kind of built into your functional assessments. Uh, regulatory reporting, any impacts to these under all of those regulations that we went through earlier, requires some kind of reporting method. Uh, and that deals with the quality of the wetlands, the quantity, uh, and that's what all these functional assessments will kind of lead to is giving that baseline information. Uh, recreational land use, again, this is a key function for this property. We're trying to, to uh, enhance it so that the kids get more out of it, whether it's fishing and ecological aesthetics, aesthetics. And so this is a big part of that model, is to understand where we are and where we can go with this model. And then integration with kind of this holistic plan. So, you know, don't make decisions in a bubble. Try and like include a lot of your stakeholders early. And what this will do is it will kind of get some of the big roadblocks out of the way because everybody feels like they're working towards a mission together. So, uh, I've obviously rattled on and on about functional assessments. Uh, do a lot of you guys use functional assessments day to day basis? No. Right. All right. So, so the U.S. I'll give you a little background because I think it's interesting. <laughs> um, so, in 1970, the U.S. decided that they were going to develop one model. They were going to develop one functional model for looking at all water streams, open waters, all of this sort of stuff, and it was going to be used nationwide, and it was going to be the gold standard. And essentially, everybody started to kind of work towards this goal. Everybody thought they had great ideas. Universities picked it up, states picked it up, all of these different entities. Even the regulatory entity itself, the Army Corps of Engineers, said, you know what? We have great ideas. This is what we regulate. We'll create a functional model. So um, to date, and again, this is me doing research and applying a lot of these models over the years to years. Anybody want to guess how many approved functional models are used in the US? How many? Okay. Come <laughs> on, no, give me one other guess. 300. <laughs> I'll give it to you. Um, so the answer is about 250 models. So, you know, it's job security, right? I mean, pick a model, do the model, don't do the model, it's 250 of them. You say 250 models? There's 250 models in the US. Yes. How is it? Well, it's not that it's not productive. The idea is, is that all of these different entities started looking at these models, right? And they're like, we want to look at the function of a weapon. Um, and so what happened was different states said, well, we can create a better mousetrap. And then the Army, the Army Corps of Engineers spent $2.4 million developing a model. Uh, and honestly, this is actually the model I predominantly use, because I figure if anybody's going to spend $2.4 million on something, it should be at least decent, right? Um, a lot of these were actually were written as thesis programs for graduate students, and the states accepted them. So there's a, a wide variety. So it's not that there's 250 models that are all great. There's 250 models that sort of work towards something. And the idea is that you have to have enough knowledge to apply the models that work towards what your goals are. And that's why earlier we said you need to start collecting all this base information so that you're not driven to fit into the model, you have the data so that you can fit the model to your situation. Um, and again, if you take all of these different models, and I don't know them all, and I don't ever care if you want to know them all, but they are basically broken into three general classifications, right? It's process and function. It's like, what is this weapon doing, and how is it functioning? Is it functioning the same in Colorado as it is in Wyoming that have similar ecological factors. And why that's important is it gives you a standard to start working towards. Then there's goods and services, meaning does this wetland support um, different, like migratory birds, does it support lumber, does it uh, support cranberries? You know, these are all kind of like more of that functional and services. And then there's this great kind of condition assessment, which is how good is it doing? And this is more if you're trying to see what a wetland's doing year to year to year. That's the simplest one, and you know, it's fine, but it doesn't really tie in all the goal that you need. And the most important thing out of this is no one model does everything, right? There's 250 of them. If they all did what you needed, there'd only be one of them. So the key thing is that you might have to use multiple models to get the answers you want, but if you use defensible models, then you can start actually predicting outcomes and you can start working towards establishing and stabilizing and, and creating this uplift to, to your projects. And it gives you kind of an overall approach as opposed to just kind of 
you know, saying, oh, well, let's go plant this many acres and see what happens. It gives you something that you can actually start predicting over the long term. So as I said, um, you know, I use kind of the functional assessment. There's a multiple functional assessments. I use the hydrogeomorphic model that was created by the Army Corps of Engineers. Within this one model, there's actually 43 uh, FCI or, or functional uh, capacity indices that are used. And this is the comparison between each of the different types of uh, wetlands, meaning you can't compare a herbaceous wetland to a forested wetland because they have different functions. One has hardwood species, has a lot of biomass, another one has grass species and you know has a different biomass but a different function. And you can't compare apples to oranges. You have to kind of compare apples to apples. And that's what each of these functional indices are. And as I said, what this does is it takes your target area on your property or whatever your project site is, if it's a mine, if it's whatever, and it looks at what that quality is based on its function and then looks at one that would be considered pristine and then it tells you where that comparison is and it's a range from zero to one. So, you know, an average wetland is 0.5, right? And you know that you have the potential to lift up to one because that would be the most pristine. Ideally, you'll never hit that on a lot of wetlands, and you don't need to hit that. But at least it gives you a metric to start lifting the function of those wetlands, and it gives you goals that you can start working towards. Excuse me, can I ask a question? I'd love to hear. Is your reference standard ecosystem natural, um, you know, for settlement? Of the it can. Yeah. Um, or is it because, I mean, these are created by a mine process? Mm -hmm. So what is your standard for that? Well, most of your most of your actual functional compa uh, capacity and reference sites are not created wetlands. They're the natural wetlands that have formed over time and naturally. So, if you are working towards a forested wetland as part of your reclamation, then you're comparing that to a historic wetland that's been forested for 20, 30 years, and that's what gives it that ability to be at that one. Um, but there, when I say that you have to actually do it compared to a reference standard. You have to you have to use the standard to get to an appropriate well. Meaning, if you have a cypress tupelo swamp, you can't compare it to a green ash wetland because they function completely different. And the beauty is, is there's 47 general reference indices for these wetlands, so you can typically find that. And then if they don't exist, as you said, if you know that your function is to get to uh, a pristine shrub scrub wetland or a tidal marsh or something to that, and you have a reference site, then you can run the same functional assessment on that, and that gives you your baseline standard. And so you would never use you would never use a constructed wetland as for as your indices. It would always be what you're comparing it to. Um, so ideally, that that bottom should be as pristine as you can find. And then you know you're working towards it. And again, you may never hit it, right? I mean, if you're in a reclamation, you have different functions with real water balance, you have different functions with your arc fluids, and you can get close and you can create a, an amazingly functioning wetland. But to say that you're going to get to a 30 year wetland that has been in a natural process is not realistic, but it gives you that goal to know kind of where you're working towards. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure. Thank you for asking the question, by the way. <laughs> So, um, again, back to the functional models. If you haven't picked up on this yet, I enjoy functional models. <laughs> um, so, essentially what these do, and, and this is just kind of a breakdown. They don't give you the answer. No model will give you the answer. If they did, we really wouldn't have a whole lot of work. Um, what these do is they give you tools to start using these assessments, and it gives you kind of the guidelines, and you can rerun the model with different scenarios to see what's the best for your, for your project your problem. And you know, the one that we're using is a good example because it brings in a bunch of social pressure, but it's not, you know, it's not one one key fits everything, right? So basically, you know, you would look at your baseline functional capacity, and this again is saying like what should it be functioning at? If nobody had ever disturbed this and this was pristine, where would it be at? And that kind of gives you that baseline. Um, and then it allows you to look at different alternatives, know where you're getting towards. Um, and then you can start looking at your resource management, what, well, how much money do you have, where do you need to get to, um, and then this also gives you kind of a baseline for your monitoring, right? This gives you kind of that, where do we need to stop? How long are we going to watch this before we say it's, it's well established and it's moving forward? Um, and then it gives you your temporal uh, limitations, meaning, you know, if you 
you can't really start right now because construction prohibits that and you're not doing it for four years, are you losing revenue? Meaning that an invasive species coming in, is your water balance starting to get messed up because you're actually losing drainage capacity? All of those sort of things come into the temporal portion of it. And again, this model, and there's 250 of them, but this one sort of, and they all have similar process. This one looks at both biological, chemical, and physical. Who am I doing that? So I've only got like 60 more slides, so you should get 40 slides. Um, so again, like this is the kind of the uh, general approach, right? You need to get your stakeholders. I was kind of messed up a little bit. Okay, so I apologize about this. Uh, so the stakeholders, you need to get them involved. Um, do not make decisions in a vacuum. It will bite you every time. Um, both your regulatory, your property owners, your different entities, um, and the local community. I mean, that's an important step in any of this. And identify where, where you're doing these models, where you're doing these type projects. Um, we're getting into a lot of issues with service areas. And when I say service areas, um, every, every place that I've worked in defines service area differently. Some of them use watersheds, some of them use political boundaries. And so you really have to understand that up front because you can kind of find an area that's great, you have a great water balance, you see a path forward, and all of a sudden you realize that it's outside of an accepted service area that you have no say in, and you kind of have to back up and go back to the drawing board. So identifying those service areas is really good. And then enhancement is this general term, right? It's enhancement. It's not necessarily just rushing out planting trees, it's not necessarily cutting on the basis. It's looking at all those functions and seeing which ones benefit your project as well as benefit kind of the whole region as well as the ecosystem, and in this case, the project. And so now that I've rambled on about other stuff, let's kind of get back to the project. And so as we talked about, we have a series of social pressures, right? And so the first one is kind of this DOT expansion. Um, you know, Department of Transportation is the same in Australia everywhere else. People need to get from point A to point B. Roads are expanding. Uh, there's a lot of capital projects that are being funded by China. And so this is a growing demand, right? This is not going away. It's going to get more and more. But just start looking at it as a balance and say, okay, you know, how do we balance these projects? And on this side, I don't know if you guys can remember the map, but essentially it was taking the strip out of the west side. That strip had these tree springs that had uh, headwaters, that had a few little wetland areas. And so it's kind of like, what do we need to do to get this back to a functional, not trying to fight a project that's going to inevitably happen, but work with the Department of Transportation to help fund some of these, these projects and kind of come back to a mutually beneficial uh, solution. And so what we worked out with are using the functional models is basically earthwork, um, developing kind of a, a living stream that was there, but moving it back, um, sharing in some of the funding, and this basically keeps your, your stream, you're sharing the funding, and it gets that back. Uh, another one is kind of the water enhancement. Uh, this is both modifying some of the open water areas and wetlands, uh, creating kind of a, a channel approach, which increases your residence time, revegetating with nitrogen, fixing vegetation, and other vegetation to control uh, runoff as far as water quality, total suspended solids, and vegetation. And then look at kind of, you know, because their impacts to water, they themselves, the DOT, would have to fund mitigation, work with them to actually accomplish some of that mitigation on the project site, which gets benefit to those wetlands. And then apply for DOT to actually monitor the water quality in the wetlands that their runoff is going into. But there are some then to help address that the solutions that we're recommending and implementing are beneficial. You know, don't act again in the vacuum. Get get their kind of funding to move forward and, and see if it's an appropriate path forward, and then adjust, adapt the management. You know. um, so the trail, this has a very similar approach. Uh, again, you know, you're trying to keep this as a little kind of a, um, secluded pocket in the middle of a developed areas so and we really want that, that tree screen. So you know work with the trail department to do this. Uh, instead of maybe having a terrestrial tree screen, actually start planting some appropriate vegetation within the, the open water to create forest wetlands, which gives you a very similar function, but it also uplifts the wetlands. It gives you kind of some enhancement and restoration towards the wetlands. Um, and then again, use some of that money for those impacts that they have to create mitigation for and do that mitigation on site and it creates this general ecological lift that gives you better fisheries divert, uh, diversity uh, and increases the benefit for the students using the property. 
And then the last one was that big gravel pit at the bottom. This is not something that's really pushed by external forces. This is more of an internal, you know, a revenue source that you know, we can reach out to additional kids. And this is kind of an interesting one because, you know, you can put a temporal delay on the actual mitigation portion of it, but because it's not impacting wetlands and it's an upland area, so you don't have those regulatory drivers, but you can actually then come back in and as part of your reclamation slash restoration for this, you can create wetlands and water bodies that help with the ecology of the area. You can actually uh, apply for the Department of Transportation to help fund some of that to offset their mitigation needs for their continued projects. To do that, you would actually have to put it into a protection as far as like conservation easement or deed restriction. But again, you get that funding source from them and you're creating habitat on the property that's still 100% usable for the mission of the property. Um, and then, you know, by taking this large tract that we want to get gravel out of, um, we can actually look at larger scale projects that create more of a benefit to this region as far as water quality, bird diversity, fisheries diversity, etc. And this is actually a project that we did that was very similar to that. You can kind of see down there, um, you know, all the earthwork to kind of create a shallow uh, basin wetland and that will eventually become a forest wetland but we're taking a staged approach so that we can actually get out monitoring prior to moving to the forest so that we can do it on a, on a more temporal control approach. Um, so kind of the overall approach for, for the data collection is use dependable data. You never know when a project's going to go to litigation. You never know who's going to review it and have opposition to it. So make sure that you're actually getting dependable, strong data. Um, utilize a functional assessment model that works for you. Don't just try and squeeze it into a model you know. Use the model that gives you the results that you need. Uh, engage stakeholders um, and collaborate early. Don't work in a vacuum. It never works out. Uh, nobody will ever agree with everything you say or want to do. Um, and then identify, this, you know, identify social pressures that we talked about, DOT, the trail, um, the gravel pit, you know, Basically, all of these can be accomplished without any major detriment to the function and mission of this project. And in fact, instead of seeing a no net loss, we actually can see a net gain to the property, meaning it has a higher function ecologically and therefore it has a better, a better availability to meet the mission with the students and the overall ecology.